and the stage was very much set for that police confrontation. They really wanted to put the protesters in their place and have a show of force. And they had published in the papers, I think they had as many as 90,000 uh, cops and military throughout the country. There's at least 10,000 in the city and everywhere they had shields and helmets and a lot of use of tear gas, which we, we first saw firsthand. Running. They threw something on the street. violence from the crowd uh, although I did see a few provocateurs in the crowd who had masks and they were covering their faces you know the vast majority of protesters were just themselves wearing the yellow vest that everyone wears and they were just there but a small handful of people were wearing masks had their face covered who you saw interacting with police, Perfect. kicking windows, throwing down motorcycles. And setting cars on fire. There was a lot of cars set on fire. set on fire but it didn't make a lot of sense because there were so many cops everywhere and there was a helicopter overhead that was monitoring the crowd from above and radioing down and somehow these cars would get set on fire and they were allowed to burn for a really really long time with nobody doing anything about it which made no sense because as soon as a group of protesters got to a street corner and amassed enough of them the cops immediately would run down that way and surround that area and start shooting at them, trying to break them up. So I mean, they were, it was full on military style police force out in the streets. And yet somehow these cars, not, not only, I mean, were they obviously being set on fire, but they were allowed to burn for just a really long time. I think we should get out of here. I think we should go. Go, come on. Because yeah, on every corner, the police were always there waiting for the crowd and... We should go. They would charge at them and challenge them with the tear gas just for standing there and doing nothing. But they wouldn't do anything to stop the cars being set on fire, which we saw again and again at corner after corner. And it seemed like they would wait for the battery to explode and make an even bigger fire, send that black smoke down the street that we saw so many times. And then eventually the fire truck would show up and put out the fire. Which is ridiculous because they knew exactly where it was and what was going on. Like I said, there was a helicopter overhead. So they could pretty much see everything that was going on from a bird's eye view. Overall, it really seemed like they were promoting this more than trying to shut it down. And I think ultimately what we could figure out about what was it about and why people were there, people are really angry because they're being pushed to their limits. They can't afford the cost of living, they're angry about the fuel tax. I think since the, the crisis, the economic crisis, um, people are more poor because um, every increase, every price is increased, uh, as that has energy. Yeah. And it's very difficult for us today because 
lot of people uh, can't finish their month. Thanks to our faith every month. So we are one wage for one month. And at the 20 of the month, some people can't eat. Yeah. So, takes on a very familiar pattern with other protests we've seen, such as the 1999 WTO protest in Seattle, where the protests are diminished and delegitimized by rioters and anarchists who break private property and give a pretext for the police reaction for the police clampdown against the people. And in particular, there's the optics and the image of broken glass, spray painted slogans, destroyed property, burning cars and things like this that really give people a, a distaste for the dissent and opposition and ultimately sort of uh, give credence to the establishment and the ruling entities. And it really seems like the powers that be have used the images and the optics of the destruction in their favor. I mean, just think about the power it gives them to have a reason to crack down. None of the protesters, the legitimate protesters down here want any of this kind of action. They can't just say, these are nonviolent protesters, there's no reason for the police response. They can cut right to the images of the worst of it and give a direct reason for cracking down and even for using force against people in the streets. More clashes with other protesters telling them to These are protests that have shaken France. In Paris, violent clashes erupted between police and protesters for the third straight weekend. Once again, we witness scenes of chaos, destruction, and anger here on the streets of Paris. Paris police are bracing for more violent protests this weekend. French authorities are still removing burned out cars, cleaning up broken glass, and scouring graffiti from buildings on the famed Champs Elysees Avenue and other Paris landmarks that were trashed by protesters over the weekend. Some protesters set cars and barricades on fire and vandalize luxury stores. The French capital suffered the worst unrest for more than a decade, with homes burnt, shops looted and clashes with police. Here, rioters placed fireworks inside a police car. Right now, French officials are considering a state of emergency to prevent more deadly unrest. It looks like Europe is unraveling. It is. It looks like Europe is unraveling. <laughs> Most French people say they support the cause of the protesters, lower taxes and better services, but not the violence. It's the same pattern, the same visuals, the same images that sort of sell it as a riot rather than just a protest of angry people. And it had the exact same pattern. So from our viewpoint, it really seemed like a largely legitimate protest that was being kind of spun and absorbed and taken over by the optics and the visuals that they really wanted to sell in the wider public. I did some looking into it, and the lady that supposedly started this whole thing is a 51-year-old musician and hypnotherapist, but she has long since stopped with this because she received a bunch of death threats and got out of the way, and now you have self-appointed people who are coming in and saying, I'm the leader of the whole protest now, like this Terry Paul Vallette guy, he is on every news station, he's being interviewed everywhere, they mention him all of the time, and I looked into him just a little bit. He's somebody who, before this, he was an actor, and he was an artist and a comedian, and he was in films, and he was in TV shows. He comes from a prominent family, he, go he apparently worked for UNESCO at some point, or he has done work in affiliation with UNESCO. All of a sudden, last year, he starts a national equality movement, and then he's in every march, he's in every protest. If, they, if they're gonna go take pictures of hundreds of protesters, they find him in the crowd and take a picture of him holding up a sign. And so, all of a sudden, this guy is now the new leader of the movement, and he's saying, well, it's not even about the tax anymore. It's now, it's about everything now. We're gonna make this even bigger. It's gonna be about something else. This was just the spark. We're, we're just getting started. This is really the next civil war. 
And I'm just saying, he looks about as phony as... It's just, you can tell he's he's got that signature pattern, just like they always do. It looks like the telltale, same old foundation funded and steered kind of thing where they take something over. And they're really pushing the idea and selling it. We, we heard it in the streets that this is a war. There, somebody was handing out flyers with guillotines on it. And they're kind of pushing that idea. But really, the truth is it's in the larger context of what's happening on a European and global scale because they're really trying to modernize society to the point where everything is digital, everything is on the grid, everything is controlled. And that's what we found in the background of this. I think it's one of the major keys that no one has really picked up on or focused on is that France is trying to assimilate its economy in the same model as the report that we did on Estonia. France has already said they're going to reach the Estonian level of e-governance by 2022. They're trying to go digital. They're trying to integrate everything into the larger regional and global system that has been slowly being built over the last several decades, half century and century. And they're reaching a crucial point where Macron and the other technocrats are trying to force it through and ordinary people, working people are reaching their limit and they're not having it. They're upset about it. And they're gonna give those people, you know, a little token a little chance to steam valve to let out their anger and then they're going to bring them back in in a few months and within a couple years because they have a relatively short deadline for making this happen in france and so they're seeing these flashpoints and and they're dealing with that through the left right paradigm the hegelian dialectic they learned helplessness. and they're getting you know a very socialized country to beg for more control ultimately because they're so vulnerable financially and economically well here's what you have you have this macron guy is it Macron or Macron? I've been going with Macron. I don't know. Macron, I'm not an expert. Macron. I don't. I've heard Macron. it pronounced many Macron. ways. Macron. Macron. He, he's it's a, like Macron. Don't. Don't. That's not. Look. I'm half French. He's a Rothschild banker. And just looking at it from an outsider's perspective, it looks to me like one of the main reasons this guy was brought in was to implement this system. Last year, the prime minister of France, Edouard Philippe, his very first official trip as prime minister was to visit Estonia, which you guys, if you follow this channel, you remember we mentioned a lot about during the Bilderberg meetings this year. He visited Estonia, that was the first thing he did and announced that France is committed to digitally transforming the country by 2022. That just so happens to be the year Macron's headed out, unless he gets put back in. So within five years, starting 2017, they said, we're gonna put in this Estonia-like digital centralization of everyone's data, everyone's information. And what it is, is they give each citizen this digital identity card, it's a national ID smart card with an electronic chip in it that centralizes everybody's data into one centralized place. And it's used for all kinds of things from electronic voting and healthcare to logging into the person's bank accounts and things like that. So they can put it all in one place and verify every citizen both digitally and in the real world. And this is really where they're trying to move the entire world. And as I was briefing myself and learning about Estonia, this really cool, tiny country, you can, you can fill out your tax return in Estonia online in five minutes. That should be a worthy aspiration for a great nation. The government should be in the cloud. And this situation right here is gonna help probably be a catalyst for pushing that towards that eventuality because they can say, well, see how everybody was in this particular situation. We really need to get this system implemented right away. And at that point, it'll be a lot easier to tax or do anything you wanna do because everyone's information is gonna be all centralized in one place. Absolutely, and, and all the graffiti in the streets and slogans on individual uh, protesters' jackets, a lot of the anger was levied against Macron, who again was groomed in the schools that you get into if you're going to be a future leader of France and a politician. Macron is the president of the rich. He's the president of, the, the, rich. The, president of the rich. But he went into the banking industry working for the Rothschilds directly, and really he won his election kind of suspiciously. There was a lot of support for Le Pen. There's a lot of supporters on the other side for the socialists. And instead, the country got an autocratic leader who pretty much declared he was going to decree auto autocratically and kind of lord over. He everyone. said he was going to be like Jupiter. He did. And the time he was a very young man, Macron was trained and groomed and mentored by an older elite class. And now his true colors are revealing themselves 
as he just announced that he desires to reign as a Jupiterian president. A remote, dignified figure like the Roman god of gods. He threatened to overrule lawmakers with a referendum if they try to frustrate the reforms that he wishes to impose on the legislature. He really pissed a lot of people off and they're all, you know, directing their anger at him. And what they're going to get out of it is probably a sort of manufactured consent of, well, he's been reined in and, you know, you have a victory now. You're going to get what you want. Get on the system and we're going to help take care of you. I mean, that's really yeah, where it's headed in the long run. They're bringing in, didn't you say they're bringing in a universal basic income type of thing in France next? year well they're doing tests in certain regions i think the southwest region of france they're doing a test and they're talking about bringing in nationally a universal basic income where everyone gets a certain minimum amount well that's one way of dealing with people who can't meet their bills exactly but in order to bring that system in they're going to do it with this digital chip card they're not going to do it any other way it'll come it'll come hand in hand with that it's all going to come together as one system right before these protests broke out President Macron launched the first ever Paris Peace Forum on the centennial of the end of World War I. In the Paris Peace Forum, where a number of world leaders will be gathering. Now, the French president, the German chancellor, as well as the secretary general of the United Nations are going to be uh, speaking there. Which was co-partnered with the Rockefeller Foundation as an effort to, quote, preserve a peaceful world order. This was attended by all kinds of world leaders, and people high up in governance. One of the questions they want to raise is, raise is uh, where has humanity gone wrong? On the Rockefeller Foundation website, it specifically notes that as a partner to the forum, the Rockefeller Foundation will keep its eyes peeled for ideas that promote good governance through advances in science and technology. And then goes on to point out that Wading into the digital state is specifically one of the Rockefeller Foundation's focus areas with this. And it mentions Estonia specifically as a prime example of this because all government services have been digitized in Estonia. It also goes on to mention the biometric digital ID system in India as, prime, as another prime example. That very first peace forum, Macron just launched that co-partnered by the Rockefeller Foundation, specifically focused on the digitizing of the state right before all of these protests kicked off. What are the odds? And this is happening at a key time where Europe as a whole, where the EU is trying to restructure digitally, and they've already done this almost in completion in Estonia, but that's a little tiny country that frankly not that many people have even heard of, no one pays attention to. But France is a major country, one of the biggest key countries of Europe. And if they get it there, it'll just be a matter of toppling the dominoes elsewhere. And so at an EU level, they're really looking to deal with immigration and customs digitally and using biometrics. And then within nation states, dealing with taxes and banking and transactions and parking tickets all digitally on the same centralized card where they can track and trace people at an individualized level. And so there's a major effort underway to overhaul the EU and digitalize all the major interactions thereof. And that's what's going on in the larger picture. And I've said this in the past, but it didn't mean what it means now because I couldn't understand it even at the time when I said it, the way that I can totally get it now this is the New World Order, One World System, this right here. And what I used to say was, the problem with a one world government and a global governance is if you don't like it, where are you gonna go? Most people aren't gonna get in their spaceship and go to Mars with Elon Musk, okay? So this is it though. They're not gonna have to make the whole world one actual global world. They're just gonna have to do it digitally. It'll be like the world is the EU. If we're all digital and we're all in this system and the system is integrated worldwide, there's your global governance. There's your one world system. There's your one world government. They've already got the UN in place with its over 300 agencies. So it's all waiting in the wings. The infrastructure's already been built. They're now just trying to implement it all. And that's part of what's going on right now. And France is key to that. 
And the same prime minister who took his first trip uh, as being prime minister to go to Estonia and announce that France was getting on this system is the same prime minister who showed up to these protests and said he was going to meet with the protesters and try to talk about their demands and everything. The whole thing is being handled. That's the thing. No one wants to hear stuff like that. And they've, they've taken these taxes away for six months, but you know this is coming back. And what sucks is there are real people in these protests who have real problems. We talked to one guy who said, you know, the problem is we only get paid in France once a month and people are not making it to the next month. They're not able to eat, you know. A whole bunch of bread in the street. And they just keep levying new taxes. Like this fuel tax is an environmental tax because they want to bring in renewable energy, but they want to do it on the backs of charging all the people for it which is exactly what they've been doing in Estonia. And really the Estonian model is what the EU and the European Commission has been pushing at a continent-wide level over the past several years. And it's been going on right in the background of these protests. And while this is getting the headlines, that's what's being implemented. Here that here's an example of people taking back their government and getting angry and showing how it's done while well, they're about to get played. That's what's really going on. Sorry if that's not what you want to hear. Yeah, I'm sorry. They're egging these people on on purpose. Revolutions have been used in history to fundamentally change society. I'm not talking about organic movements that sprang up out of nowhere and it's true and it's real. I'm talking about following an order out of chaos model to bring about a fundamental transformation of society. It's what happened during the original French Revolution, and it's what they're trying to do in France, and in Europe, and the world today. It's order out of chaos. Okay, well, I was just gonna say, um back to that you know when it comes to the yellow vest movement yeah the thing is the unfortunate thing is with a lot of those countries especially france and it, the, these paradigms can be seen worldwide they're taking a step in the right direction but again it's only a step it's not the full you know not it's not the whole nine yards they're not yeah they're just standing there at this point it's it, it's an act of non-compliance but it's, it's at a level that it's kind of almost infantile in nature. And what people have to get through at this point, or at least start to realize, and I hope people are starting to realize this, is it's got to be, like you're saying, when you see people lighting cars on fire, don't just stand there and film them. Literally get in their way. Punch them in the face. Knock them out. Beat the crap out of them. You know, stuff that Molotov cocktail down their shirt and let them light on fire, you know? Don't, don't let them destroy infrastructure and make you look bad. And the one thing that I'll give, I will give these these yellow vesters, I will give them credit because I've also seen the footage. I've seen these people literally talk to the cops and I've literally seen the cops take their riot gear off, you know, take their shit off and literally join these people because they literally get through them. They break that programming and then these officers are literally questioning why they're even there. And it's not in all cases. Sometimes they can't. Sometimes you're dealing with thugs and you can't talk to them. But there are cases in which I have seen where these people get through to these people and, you know, they do the right thing and they, they you know, join in on the noncompliance. But it's a start in the right direction, but it's going to have to be fine-tuned and, you know, there's going to have to be strategy, obviously, added. Yeah, because you're dealing with, you're dealing with a psychopathic ruling class of people that have been at it for so long who are playing you know chess 10 steps ahead on so many different levels that 
yeah, you got to realize that this is a very, very smart, cunning snake, and nine times out of ten, it's going to bite you and inject you with venom at some level. Yeah. Well, you you, yeah, you use the word snake there, um, and how do you kill a snake is to cut off its head, essentially. That's the old adage. Are the yellow vest protesters cutting off the head? No? No. Okay. Have they blocked a Bilderberg conference? Have they done uh, anything <clears throat> anti-globalist inherently? No. Okay. So this, the showing, to, if I may, if I may, uh, I just want to explain this as well uh, by comparison to, uh, say, the Occupy movement. Okay. So I was a member mm. of the Occupy movement back in 2012, and I made more videos by myself than their entire media team d uh, did here in New Zealand. Okay. By my fucking self. You know why? Because instead of being in a goddamn tent, I was in a fucking office actually doing shit right now here's the thing i came to a realization after that movement got collapsed all right it, it just got forced out completely illegally they hired private security and they illegally stopped them from protesting and i thought to myself isn't this interesting you've got a movement that has no means of protecting itself against illegal activity from the government you've got a movement that is in no way threatening the establishment all right and when i say that people go what do you mean the occupy movement totally threatened the establishment really do you think fucking elite billionaires were sitting there in their high-rise apartment buildings and things like that with with uh, umpteen amount of children to rape that evening and they were sitting there going oh my god whatever are we gonna do they've they've got fucking tents what else I don't know how to fucking oppose that shit. Oh, oh, oh my god, they're camping. They're fucking camping. They were laughing. They were laughing at him. They were laughing at him. Well, it's the same thing saying. that happened in 2011 in Tahrir Square. You remember the Arab Spring thing? It was the same sort of deal in the Middle East. Sick. You had a bunch of people go into the square. They were standing there. They were demanding change. Okay, so one asshole steps down. Oh, the Muslim Brotherhood steps in because CIA... The CIA and a whole bunch of giant elite tech monopoly companies had stepped in and said, "Oh, we're going to stick our plant in here, you know, and we're going to we're going to destabilize Egypt so we can do what we do in Syria and Libya." And they were going to try to destabilize Egypt, and fortunately, that kind of backfired on them in a real bad way. But the lesson that can be learned there, because I saw a really good documentary on Netflix that was done about the whole thing from all sides, the thing that can be taken away from that is you can't go into the streets and demand that the babysitters do anything. You cannot go to them and say, stop what you're doing. They're not going to stop. They're going to continue to kill. They're going to continue to bomb children in the Gaza Strip. They're going to continue to blow things up. They're going to continue to destroy history in the Middle East. You know, They're going to continue to do all that, desecrate, kill, murder, whatever it is you're that right. they've been doing for tens of thousands of years. Mm. You know, But the point is, you know, it's got to be, if it's going to be effective, it's got to be like, you know, well, head of the snake. You, you, know, you we were talking about that before, right? Um, uh, so here's the thing: how many people in this world are willing to kill another human being in order to prevent that human being from killing <clears throat> them or their family or destroying their nation? Not many. However, yeah. How many people who are currently killing children and killing uh, states and, and things of that nature would be really, really frightened if somebody actually tried to come and kill them for what they were doing? All right, but one last point here. Uh, when we interviewed a former CIA assassin, we asked him, how do you get these globalist scumbags? You know, you can't get them. They're covered by security and all of this shit. And he says, simple. You take out their families. Isn't that interesting, right? That's the whole thing um, that we have to understand now is that the families of the New World Order are in fact the most vulnerable targets. And when people realize that their families are, giving, are getting given real consequence and real threat from their actions, they might stop behaving in such a way. They might think to themselves, maybe having my family killed isn't worth the, uh, the paycheck I'm getting here. I think I'm going to switch my job. You know, that kind of thing. Um, and that is a really, really terrible thing to say, isn't it? Because it's a fucking war crime to go after people's families. But it's also a war crime uh, to fucking... Uh, 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 invade Gaza and, and do all of these other things like the state, state of Israel. War crimes are happening all the goddamn time. And if the only way to defend yourself, essentially, is to do an immoral act... Isn't that what they want, though? You know? 
because then they'll be like, ha ah, now we've got justification. They're using violence. Ha ha ha. And then they can come in because they, they've got the violence. They've got the nukes. They've got the, they've got the troops. They've got the uh, unlimited funds. And they've got the media propaganda to turn the whole world against us. So that's the thing. We're dealing with such a complex uh, scenario here that to think that just getting out on the street in a high visibility vest is going to stop people who've been part of a conspiracy for several hundred years who have dedicated their bloodlines, their progeny, their fortunes, and everything that is a fiber of their being. They've dedicated it to scumbaggery, to destruction, to kill each and every person who opposes them. Do you think being in a high visibility vest is going to discourage somebody like that? They own a hell of a lot of people who wear high visibility vests, ladies and gentlemen, and they've also got weapons, and they can use them, and they can use them without consequence to themselves either. You know, how many of the cops that have uh, basically shot protesters in the head with rubber bullets have been arrested or charged? Zero? Okay, zero. How many, uh, how many cops that have uh, viciously beat protesters over the head with batons been charged or arrested? Zero. Okay, so... If we're going up against a violent regime, self-defense is absolutely necessary. There is one video that the Yellow Vests uh, uh, have put out so far, and the guy wasn't even wearing a Yellow Vest that I found inspiring. It was a fighter. A man with his fists up, charging against yep. cops who had a fucking shield. Okay? That's the thing. And the cops were backing away because they don't know how to deal with a slave that won't say yes. OK, that's the thing yep. um, that we've got to do. Imagine, ladies and gentlemen, if the yellow vests did precisely what the Indians did under Gandhi. Here's what they did. The men form one line at the front of the protest against the police. They push themselves directly into their batons. They allow themselves to have the shit beaten out of them. And when they go down after they cannot be beaten anymore... The second line behind them is made of women. Those women will grab those men and they will pull them back into the crowd and treat them and help them and that kind of thing. And the third line is another group of men and they move forward and they allow themselves to be beaten and destroyed until they go down. And eventually, every single stick that the British soldiers beat these Indian people with snapped in half. Human skull breaking their weapons that is how powerful we are when we're dedicated when we have a strategy when we understand ancient methods of warfare the phalanx ladies and gentlemen alexander the great managed to destroy armies 10 to 20 times his size by simply having a coordinated action a a formation that could not be penetrated that could not be destroyed and if you go out there with uh, fucking you know vests and things like that and you're just milling around or non-violently and you're not organized and you're not formed into ranks and you're not fucking organized like that you will fail They'll just fucking shoot you with water cannons. They'll beat you with sticks. They'll charge you away with tear gas. You're fucked. I agree. And there's a there's a couple of things I'd like to add before I forget. <clears throat> and uh, Katarina will be back in a bit. A um, couple of things I want to add before I forget. There is one thing that um, the Yellow Vest did try to do. Um, they actually did try to storm a government building. They almost got it, but they failed. And um, one thing that they're considering doing, now, I haven't, you know, I don't have this confirmed. I don't know if this is rumor or if this is, like, legit. Um, there's all these different Yellow Vest uprisings in, uh, in all these other uh, cities in France, right? They're all planning, coordinated, same day, same time. All of them at once converge on Paris, you know, and do what needs to be done in a style of what you're talking about, supposedly, allegedly. The second thing I wanted to say about it is, um, like Max had said, if, you know, the, the system that runs everything, regardless of, you know, what the elites have, the system that runs everything, kind of like, you've seen the Matrix movies, right, Vinny? No, no, i never heard of them. Of course I've fucking seen the Matrix movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's Matrix like movie ask, movie. asking a truth. Yeah, have you, do you know 9-11 was an inside job? <laughs> hey, not everybody's seen them. Richard hasn't seen them. 
But anyway, uh, oh my one, God, I'm, I'm one, of the, one of the lines in the Matrix is that the machines um, are bound by their own system. The machines are powerful, but they the machines have set up this construct that supports them. So they can't defy the construct, otherwise they eliminate their own support base. They're, you know, just like a psychopath is like a, like a machine, the corporate machine. Um, so they have this funny money Ponzi financial system. Everything is supported by the financial system, which is why the most important vote is with your dollars. So that's why Max has said, if everybody was non-compliant, and withdrew from the system, then theoretically you could change the world in a day. Well, the main strategy of the yellow vest is non-compliance in the way Max was talking about. Not showing up for work, just refusing to participate in the system. Now, what I don't know is whether or not the people that are doing this realize what Max realizes and are doing it as a strategy, or if it's simply an impulse reaction to being pissed off, stressed out, and fed up. Because if it's the second, then they're in big trouble. But if it's the first, then they might have a chance. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I think uh, being incredibly cynical uh, and jaded is probably one of the most important things for anybody who wants to realistically look at the New World Order system and uh, instead of being airy-fairy about it, wants to really understand it and wants to actually defeat it. That is oh, yeah. essentially I'm not, it. Now, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying be airy-fairy. I'm just saying to understand that you're voting with your dollars, you know, and if you withdraw from that system then that system collapses. Like Matt, I, I don't think so. It's it's never happened before. There's no, there's no. I haven't seen any precedent um, that proves that thought because uh, primarily the problem is mass participation. You can't get mass participation if the elite control all the media. You can't get mass participation if everybody's massively in debt to all the bankers and and doesn't have more than a day's worth of food in their house. You can't get massive uh, 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 resistance, and and they know this. Uh, because they've structured society specifically this way. And in fact, there's, I believe that the vast majority of mass movements that we've ever seen um, are in fact created by the New World Order as a pressure release valve, okay? You can only go so long in misery and depression before some kind of catharsis needs to happen. And this is what that 10-year cycle is about, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Every 10 years or so, you'll see something that inspires you and keeps you happy and keeps you going on doing the exact same fucking thing without dedicating your life and your progeny and, and every fiber of your being to defeat the new world order. That's what they want. They want you to think that something's being done when the reality is nothing's changing. Um, I'll be right back in a moment. I got someone at my door. <sighs> Might be the uh, the police in the yellow vest. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That'd be funny, wouldn't it? Uh, but but yeah, I I do think that there's much that we can do essentially. But the whole mass idea—that's collectivism essentially. Sure, you can get two people or three people well, or whatever. You can move a piano. Here's, here's uh, the other. Here's the other perspective of that. Also, you know, it's not. It really isn't truly. A, even France, like, you know, I don't know the population of France off the top of my hand, but even, so say there's 7 billion people on the planet, that's a lot of people. Uh, sorry, sorry, to inter sorry to interrupt, but I need to. Um, I will I will be um, right back in a, in a few minutes. I literally have to pop off here, but I'm going to rejoin. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay, so... Um... What were we talking about before? Ah, yes, yes, yes. This whole this whole uh, global strategy thing. Now, um, if we have like um, that jaded cynicism that I, that I was talking about before, because uh, 
that whole I hope in this, I believe in this, you know, that kind of thing. I believe it's in, in large part just a manipulation of, of uh, our own psyche, essentially. Um, and I think that's what superhero movies are about as well. Everybody sees something wrong with the world. They want to do something about it, but they don't do anything. So in order to feel good about it, they go to see a movie so that they can escape from their reality and see somebody else doing something about the bad shit that's happening in the world, whatever. We're being placated massively from every single conceivable direction the the media the movies the music every single uh, form of art or cultural influence that exists in the world today regardless of which country you reside in is specifically tailored to destroy your individuality your independence okay and to get you to think that being part of a collective being part of a big fucking group or something like that is the oh, is the best thing you could possibly be you know be part of the tribe Otherwise, the tribe might just leave you in the dust and you might just starve to fucking death. You know, that's the kind of thing. Well, um, social for- anxiety. Um, whereas I believe it's not huge groups and swaths of individuals that actually get the best shit done in society. It's usually just one dude, you know, like a Tesla, you know, or or or, or uh, some, something like that. There are many, many individuals throughout history that you can name and point a finger at and have historical evidence that says, this guy actually fucking accomplished something. But there are no groups of people. No huge fucking movements and things like that that you can really point to that accomplished fucking anything. All right? Because they were all led by somebody, weren't they? Well, here's the new... Here's... Yeah. And a lot of those movements, all of the movements that you can name in recent memory are based on the old paradigm idea of it's the same globalist system that co-ops the movement. And it becomes this pyramidal structure of where everybody's answering to one or a a small group of people and the power is directed on down the pyramid. See, the thing is that people aren't used to or people aren't aware of because people don't think in those terms because everybody's caught in that cultural co-opted state of go with the group, go with the tribe, go with you know, whatever the mass of the greatest mass of people is going with, whether it's the NFL, whether it's any any of these these orchestrated things that the establishment controls. There have been many great individuals for sure, but the other I'll play devil's advocate here. What if, you know, some of the greatest individuals throughout history decided to come together and at least agree that there's a problem, but nobody submitted to each other in that that slave sort of fashion. They all agreed, we need to work together, but not to that sense of like one's bowing to the other or everybody's answering to one person. It's a bunch of great people coming together and doing something that needs to be done. You know, imagine if you had 50 or 100 Nikola Teslas all working together to do something. You can't. To do Uh something creative. I mean, it's a new idea. Yeah, no, and when not. something has never been done, when it's something has never it's ever not a been new done, idea. it's going to sound like nonsense. All right, well, well, let's say, for example, holding your breath forever and not dying is not a new idea because people have tried it and fucking failed, okay? Uh, just like uh, organizing a whole bunch of people who are really, really brilliant and everything together is remarkably difficult. The majority of the founding fathers fucking hated each other. Samuel Adams mm. said that if you uh, 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 value the comfortable chains of slavery versus the challenging dangers of freedom go from this place in peace we don't want you here and we don't need you and may your children forget that you were ever members of our country that is the kind of dedication that comes from individuals when they realize their own power that's the kind of thing. So you see people like Truthstream Media, Luke Rudkowski, they go directly into this yellow vest uh, scenario and they cover this thing objectively. They point out the bullshit and, and what have you. But again, my, my thing is this whole overall strategy, who's coordinating. And even if you do, if you, give a, if you give a movement a leader or a figurehead, what happens? They get fucking busted, don't they? They get raided illegally for organizing all of this shit. Now, the way that the New World Order according to the Quigley formula, which is um, <clears throat> Carol Quigley, wrote a book called Tragedy and Hope. Now, in this, he chronicles the history of the New World Order, more or less. He doesn't call them that. He calls them the group, okay, because they don't have a name. They figured out that 
the best way to rule from behind the scenes is to not be capable of even being identified. All right? How do you oppose a group that doesn't even have a name? How do you oppose a group that cannot even be said to truly exist? The answer is you cannot. So they uh, f figured out this system. It's called rings within rings within rings within rings. Okay, so top of the pyramid, theoretically, there's four guys. Okay, four really brilliant, dangerous, incredibly powerful men. And they have decided to hatch a conspiracy to overthrow all the churches of the world, all the governments, and all the uh, financial freedoms of all of their slaves and serfs. 